Okay, so we're going to have a look at how to calculate the value of this sort of infinite stack of integrals here. So first of all, let's just take a moment and think, what does this even mean? Well, if you start at the bottom, you're integrating 2x with respect to x between 1 and then your upper limit of integration. In order to calculate this, you've got to do this integral. So here you're integrating the same thing between 1 and, again, your upper limit of integration. You need to calculate this integral, which requires you to calculate this integral to get the upper limit there, and so on and so on forever. So how are we going to actually find the value for this thing? Well, perhaps if you've seen similar sort of problems before, maybe with infinite stacks of powers, there's a really nice way to do this, which I'll show you now. So let's define the whole thing to be equal to i, first of all. So we're just saying that the whole stack of integrals is called i. And you may notice here that if you look at your upper limit of integration for your first one, this is just... It's just a copy of i. It's a copy of this whole stack just placed in the upper limit of integration. So this is what gives us a handle on the problem here, because now I can write i is equal to the integral between 1 and i of 2x with respect to x. So you can see here this i just matches up with the infinite stack of integrals there. So this is really good, because now actually calculating the integral is really straightforward. You just get x squared at i and 1 get i squared minus 1 squared, and then we can rearrange then to get 0 is equal to i squared minus i minus 1, and then solve this using your quadratic formula, you get i is equal to a half plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2, and then you may even notice at this point that half minus root 5 over 2, well this is less than 1, so surely if we're integrating between 1 and something, you want that something to be greater than 1, so it's not unreasonable then to conclude that i is equal to a half plus root 5 over 2. This is our only solution. And this is especially nice because this is actually equal to phi, the golden ratio. But unfortunately we're not done here. It turns out there's actually a lot more to uncover if we look at this problem more closely. So the very first question we ought to ask here if we're trying to calculate the value of this big infinite integral is, is this well defined? And it turns out the answer is actually no here. I'll try and explain why. So if you wanted to find the answer to this, you would need to find out basically what's happening after, say, n iterations, and then you'd want to take limits as n goes to infinity to do this rigorously. However, you can't really work out what's going on with this after n iterations, because you could try doing this, say, for four iterations, but you don't know what your upper limit of integration has to be. So without that information, it's not actually possible to get this set up properly. What you'd want is something that looks like this. So a1, this is equal to the integral between 1 and something of 2x with respect to x. So this might be our first iteration, and then our second term in the sequence will be the integral between 1 and then between 1 and something, 2x dx, of 2x with respect to x once again. And then you'd be looking at a n, this is basically equal to the integral between 1 and a n minus 1, 2x with respect to x. The problem is we don't know what this value is, this is the question mark. And what we'll do at this stage is, rather than having a question mark, we'll actually introduce a new parameter t. So now we've got a sequence which depends on t here, and it's not immediately clear that you'll get the same answer for the same value of t. But we have, we've at least got something that depends on t that is well defined here. And then you can actually forget about the fact that you're doing integration now, because you can evaluate this, you just get t squared minus 1. So this one you would get a1 of t squared minus 1. And then here you're looking at a n minus 1 of t, all squared minus 1. And then this tells us then that this big infinite stack of integrals, we could define this now dependent on this parameter t, as far as we know just define this as the limit as n goes to infinity of a n of t. So next we'll have a go at actually trying to calculate this limit. So we've got this kind of recursive definition now, and you may even spot that if you define the function f of x to be equal to just x squared minus 1, you may notice here that a1 of t, well this is just equal to f of t, and then a2 of t, what you're really doing here is just doing f of f of t. 
And then if you wanted to keep going, say, a n of t, so our nth term in this sequence, this will be where you've applied f to itself n times, having started at t. And we'll define this just as f small n of t, so we've got a nice kind of compact notation, where we're doing this n times. But having this sort of setup, this allows us to now kind of get a handle on the problem. So let's, we'll just start off and think, what happens if t is 5, the golden ratio? So you imagine we started off our initial upper limit of integration is 5. So you might notice that f of 5, well this is equal to 5 squared minus 1. But remember we got 5 as a solution to this equation, x squared minus 1 equals x. It's pretty straightforward to check that phi squared minus 1 is equal to phi. So you apply f to phi, you just get the same output, phi. So if you apply f again, you get phi out again. And then if you do this n times, so fn of phi, this is also just always going to spit out the same value. So this is a fixed point of our function f. So then when you take limits as n goes to infinity of this, you'll still also get phi. So this tells us that i our integral, when you start off with your upper limit of integration is phi, you indeed get phi, which is what we were hoping for. So back at the start of the video, there was another solution that we kind of overlooked, so now's a good time to return to that, and that was t equals a half minus root 5 over 2. So this was another solution of x squared minus 1 equals x. So let's have a think what happens here if we do f of t here. So f of a half minus root 5 over 2. This is a half minus root 5 over 2 squared minus 1. But then remember this was a solution to x squared minus 1 equals x. So actually you're just going to, when you apply f to this function, you're going to get the same output as your input here, a half minus root 5 over 2. So this tells you that if we apply f over and over and over, to a half minus root 5 over 2, you always just get the same thing back. And this is nice because now when we take limits as n goes to infinity, this suggests then that actually i of a half minus root 5 over 2 is equal to a half minus root 5 over 2. So if you start off with your integral and your upper limit of integration is a half minus root 5 over 2, it seems that you'll get your limit will be a half minus root 5 over 2 again. But there's something a bit strange here, because we were integrating from 1 to this value, and this value is actually less than 1. So maybe this is a bit of a problem. But fortunately, you can resolve this quite easily, because if you're integrating from a big value to a smaller value, you can just reverse the order of integration from this limit to this limit and introduce a negative sign. So we can still make sense of this mathematically, even if the notation's a little bit of a problem. Okay, so let's consider now other values of t. We've sort of established what happens when t is 5, what happens when t is this half minus root 5 over 2. So you may have noticed we're doing a kind of fixed point iteration here on this function f, and it turns out there are only two fixed points here. So there's the one at phi and there's the one at half minus root 5 over 2. And what's interesting here is the gradient at phi of this function f is greater than 1, and the gradient here at half minus root 5 over 2, this is less than minus 1. So essentially what this tells you, if you know about fixed point iteration, is that these are both unstable fixed points. So basically if you put a different value of t in as your starting value, even if it's really, really close to phi, your iteration is never going to converge to phi. So actually what we can conclude here then is for any other value of t, as long as it's not equal to a half minus root 5 over 2, or it's not equal to phi, this is going to, your iteration is just going to diverge to infinity. So we can actually conclude here then, i of t, this is equal to, we know that it's equal to phi when you start off t equals phi, and you know that it's equal to a half minus root 5 over 2 when t is equal to a half minus root 5 over 2. And then drawing on our knowledge of fixed point iteration here, you can just say then this is equal to infinity otherwise. So essentially we're saying that our infinite stack of integrals, this is only ever well defined if your starting value, your first upper limit of integration t, 
is equal to 5, or a half minus root 5 over 2. Otherwise, it's perfectly reasonable to say your answer is just infinity for any other value.